Guys, welcome back to Serials at Midnight. My name is Heath. It's been a while since the last installment of this series, and I thought that there would be no better title for our return than the granddaddy of them all. I'm talking about Flash Gordon. 1936, the very first Flash Gordon serial, inspired. It's not inspired, it's the same thing. Uh, taken from the source material of Alex Raymond's newspaper comic strip that had debuted in 1934. America was looking for an escape, right? They were looking for, we're coming out of the Great Depression. They're looking for something to take their mind off of the troubles that they've been through, set their eyes to the stars. Flash Gordon takes off, literally rockets into space. Uh, the plot line is, it's pretty thin. Flash is a star polo player, uh, and he is on a, a, an airplane with uh, Dale Arden, played by Gene Rogers. And the plane goes down, they end up kind of parachuting down, and they, they escape, they, they, they end up on the ground, where they meet Dr. Zarkov, who says, there's a planet headed towards Earth, we got to figure out what's going on, I'm going to hop in this rocket ship, go to that planet and see what's going on. They do, they arrive, the planet, it's not an accident, Ming the Merciless is controlling this planet, uh, he wants to destroy the Earth, so immediately within the first episode, really, within the first chapter or two, we have all of our characters, all of our motivations, Flash versus Ming, protecting Dale. Uh, Dr. Zarkov is the, uh, the scientific savior. Of course, if this sounds familiar to you, it's that the 1980 movie, uh, the Dino De Laurentiis produced Flash Gordon movie from 1980 with the Queen music, it's the same thing as this. It's so interesting to see how the, the staying power of Flash Gordon, right? These, these ideas, these characters, these concepts are relatively unaltered since their very inception by Alex Raymond in 1934. Um, so let's take a look at the influence first because I want to talk about that. Uh, George Lucas, it, it's impossible to talk about Flash Gordon and not talk about the influence of, of Flash Gordon on George Lucas because... You know, in the 70s, before he made Star Wars, he wanted to make uh, a Flash Gordon movie. Tried to get the rights to it, could not do it. So he made his own Flash Gordon, right? Uh, he made Star Wars with the sword fighting, all the sword fighting, all the ray guns, but they're called blasters now. You know, uh, swords get turned into lightsabers. Uh, ray guns get turned into blasters. But it's so inspired by Flash Gordon. And if you watch this 1936 serial... Uh, which is 13 chapters and cost, it was, it's a universal production and they threw a lot of money at this thing. Over a million dollars in 1936 uh, goes into the, 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 the making of this thing. If you watch the serial, you see so much of uh, Flash Gordon's style. The characterizations, right? But it's also the sets, it's the, it's the atmosphere. It's, you know, there's a Ming the Merciless's uh, lair has a trap door. You fall through the trap door and then there's like this alligator man guy that lives under there. It's Jabba's palace and the Roncor. Like all this stuff comes directly from the influences of Flash Gordon. Uh, so it's a it's it's just fascinating to see how this stuff has just continued to stay with us. And of course, when people when Flash Gordon the movie in 1980 uh, is inspired by Star Wars, we've now gone full circle, right? Flash Gordon inspires Star Wars, which inspires Flash Gordon. Um, so it's it's very cool. But let's talk a little bit about some of the behind the scenes stuff, right? So as I say, 13 chapters, over a million dollars. It's Universal. And Universal during the 30s is, uh, you know, who was doing genre movies, horror, sci-fi, better than Universal in the 1930s. And be, even though they had this massive budget, you know, a million dollars actually divided across 13 chapters, that's, it's still kind of tight. But they are using what they already have. So they're using costumes and props from the Universal archives, sets from Frankenstein, uh, show up in the movie. Uh, the Mummy the sets from The Mummy show up in the movie. Even the music. So the music is taken from other Universal films. The Invisible Man, The Invisible Ray, uh, Frank, The Bride of Frankenstein, uh, Werewolf of London. Uh, and then they, they're also doing like classical music, right? They're recognizable classic classical music motifs in Flash Gordon. So I don't think any music was created anew for Flash Gordon. I think everything that's here has been repurposed from either a former Universal project or from classical music. So 
Uh, Flash himself is played by Larry Buster Crab, uh, which is not his real name. That was his Hollywood name. And then he just would go by Buster, right? Uh, a, a true legend of the B-movie scene. He was in so many lower budget movies, B-movies, uh, chapter plays, serials, things like this. Uh, he had been an, an Olympic athlete, Olympic swimmer, actually. And in 1933, he played Tarzan. Uh, and then here we are, just a matter of you know, a few short years later after his Olympic career, he is Flash Gordon. And again, this thing was huge. This launched him both you know, figuratively in the plot of the movie, or the plot of the show, and uh, in, in pop culture, really launched him to the stratosphere. And then from there, it was just like one B-movie hero role after another for the next you know 20 years or so uh, and beyond, I guess. Uh, Gene Rogers is uh, his Dale Arden who is, uh, she's dyed blonde here. I should also say Larry Buster Crab, not a natural blonde. He dyed his hair blonde for this role and he hated it. He hated that blonde hair. He didn't like the way it made him look. He didn't like the comments that he would get. He said it in an interview, like he wouldn't even take, it was a 60s interview. He wouldn't take his hat off around women because he was embarrassed of his super blonde hair. You know, it was not a masculine look in 1936. Uh, but Jean Rogers is a natural, first of all, she's gorgeous. She's a natural brunette. And in Flash Gordon, she plays Del Arden as a, as a blonde, which I have read was sort of maybe the influence of the Jean Harlow, the blonde bombshell sort of a thing, um, the, the temptress that she played her blonde. And then later in, you know, there are two sequels to this. There are two other serials, two other Flash Gordon serials, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about at some point here. But she was, you know, she didn't, she did not dye her hair for the next one. Um, the characters, right? So the character, so Dr. Zarkov is played by Frank Shannon. And uh, if you ever want to see a man with really hairy legs and shorts that are just too small, uh, then that's Dr. Zarkov in this in this serial, I mean, the costumes in this, it's, it's real. there are so many things that are like, wow, short, short, short shorts on men, lots of hairy legs, lots of, uh, you know, the, 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 so Jean Rogers is gorgeous. She's in a like kind of a bare midriff outfit for most of the serial, but a lot of the guys too, you're like, oh, that's, you know, maybe, maybe not the best look for some of the actors, but um, it's, it's very, it's a Romanesque maybe, you know, kind of going on that Roman gladiator thing. Uh, so Charles Middleton is being the merciless. Um, Princess Aura is played by Priscilla Lawson, a wonderful. I think she's great. I think she plays the duality of Aura very well. She loves Flash Gordon, but she would just as soon kill him if she can't have him. She knows that he wants to be with uh, with with Dale, and that does not sit well. So she is, you know, being the 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 heir of Ming. Uh, she's willing to do whatever it takes to, to win, to have her flash. Um, there's a tragic story behind the scenes for Priscilla Lawson. As I understand it, she went into the military service during the war when World War II came calling, uh, lost uh, her leg, lost at least one leg, and then sort of died very quickly after that. A, a very sad story. But, you know, these movies live on, these serials, these movies live on, and she's always going to be Princess Ara. Prince Baron. We are introduced to Prince Baron, who's another, like, the rightful heir of Mongo. But there's unrest on Mongo. Prince Baron is sort of the rightful heir, the challenger to the throne. Uh, he is played by Richard Alexander, very nobly, very well. Uh, King Volton. I really wanted to talk about King Volton because he's played, uh, he's the, you know, the ruler of the Birdmen of, of Sky City. Uh, played by, by Jack Tiny Lipson. One of his few on-screen roles, and if you think that's what um, what uh, what the 1980 movie does for Prince Volton, Brian Blessed's performance, that large bombastic, if you think, well, that's so Brian Blessed, it is. But he's totally echoing what Tiny Lipson did in 1936. There are a few scenes where Tiny Lipson is not guffawing. It's that hearty, like, ho, 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 ho. He's a huge, hairy, burly man, big old beard, you know, uh, a man of mirth. 
and he's a kind of a noble character as he is maybe in the 1980 Flash Gordon movie as well. He's sort of a noble figure who sees the corruption of Ming, does not like to see people treated unfairly. It's a very interesting part. And uh, it's just so interesting. Like for me, who is discovering some of these older things and connecting them to the present, like Brian Blessed gets so much praise and credit for his portrayal. But it's pretty much a Xerox copy of what, uh, of what Tiny Lipson was doing in 1936. Thune, the Prince of the Lion Men, is played by James Pierce. Now in the 20s, James Pierce was also a Tarzan. So uh, Buster Crab was Tarzan in 1933. But in the 20s, the guy that plays Thune, King of the Lion Men, uh, he or Prince, he's a prince, was also uh, a Tarzan. So tar, you know, Tarzan going way back to the foundation of cinema. Uh, King Kala, Lord of the Shark Men, is played by Duke York. Uh, and you just see all these characters. These come from the comic book strip. Had only been around for two years, right? All these characters in this movie, everybody's there. Everybody has their motivations. We have this vast, huge world that has been set up. Um, I will say that for 13 chapters, this movie, serials can occasionally, especially if you watch more than one in a row, sometimes they can drag because by nature they have to just be a little chunk of a story, right? They're not one continuing movie narrative, they're just one chunk of a story. So uh, sometimes this this does drag a little bit. You find themselves, well, there's a lot of business, right? Like, well, we got to go down to the, to the, la- to the, to the, to the undersea kingdom of the Sharkmen, then back up to Ming's palace, then to the, the kingdom in the sky, then back to Ming, then back to the sharks, then back, you know, a lot of just back and forth and back and forth. Um, whereas the 1980 movie, of course, doesn't have to, they, it's so funny because the movie is like the first, I don't know, five chapters of this, of this serial. It's kind of been condensed, right? But so much of the movie is the ground, like the groundwork for the movie is laid out before us in the 1936 Flash Gordon serial. You have to imagine the screenwriters went home, then maybe they got a 16 millimeter print of the 36 serial. They go home, they just take notes and they're like, I think we got our movie. <laughs> the first four or five chapters, I think we got our movie. It's essentially the exact same thing. Like the exact same thing. Now, the special effects aren't as good. But remember, a million dollars in 1936 was huge. And the special effects are actually fairly decent for what they are. Now, we can laugh at them now. We got a lot of rocket ships that have, they're on strings, right? Visible strings and smoke and things like those smoking models and stuff. Uh, they shot a lot of stuff in Bronson Canyon, substituting for... Alien Mongo is the alien landscape. There are iguanas with <laughs> with like spikes and stuff glued onto their backs, uh, as was the practice back then, right? But it's the special effects, right? They are doing the best they can with 1936 technology, uh, and it is fairly good for what it is. Like you, you don't. I say sometimes don't go to things like this on your terms, expecting it to meet you where you're at. You have to go to 1936, right? Some, a lot of times past, you have to go meet it on its own terms. But if you do, uh, it's just so much fun. There's not much left to say about about the first Flash Gordon serial. Uh, again, two sequels would follow. Uh, Buck Rogers would follow. And of course, I'm not talking about the 70s Gil Gerard TV show. I'm talking about the serial Buck Rogers. All this stuff goes back to the 1930s. Uh, the, the, the ripples that we see in our society today originated from the stones that landed in the water in the 1930s. Those original, the original waves that created the ripples that go out. Um, but if you want to catch up with Flash Gordon, you got a lot of different ways to do it. But uh, as far as home media goes, I know a lot of us are home media enthusiasts. So Image Entertainment released a pretty spectacular Flash Gordon. It's, it's sort of a box set. It's got like a trifold package. Um, uh, like a booklet's inside. Uh, it has the original, it has all three of the serials in there and, and a booklet as well. But it's out of print and it's kind of hard to find. Uh, it seemed for a while like VCI was going to be doing a Blu-ray restoration for it. It really does need a restoration. These elements are not in great shape at this point. Uh, you know, we're talking about probably what I watched. I watched, I have the image, I have that image box set. Probably sourced from 16 millimeter footage, lots of you know visible splices, some audio dropouts. That's kind of part of the fun, to be honest with you. When you watch something like this, something like you don't you you do want it to be clean, you do want it to be preserved, right? You don't want this stuff to die. But 
Uh, part of the fun sometimes is watching it in these kind of battered prints because it does take you back in time. It has a living history in those frames. So um, 1936, Flash Gordon, an absolutely incomparable influence on every science fiction project that came after it, from comics to novels to other serials to movies like Star Wars and then the, the 1980 Dino De Laurentiis production of Flash Gordon and then the echoes all the way through society now. There's still, you know, there was a sci-fi series for Flash Gordon not that long ago. Uh, the character is not going anywhere. He is here to stay, but it all started on the screen in 1936 and uh, it holds up like gangbusters. So guys, that's gonna wrap up this installment of Serials at Midnight. Where should we go from here? We've got, we've covered uh, a Rocket Man, we've covered Superman, and now we've covered Flash Gordon. Where do we go from here? The Shadow, Batman? There's so many different directions. Maybe we go to the jungle. I think perhaps the jungle should be our next destination for this expedition. Guys, thanks for watching. I appreciate you so very much. Take care until next time. Here's where to go and what to do.